Hello, uh, today I wanted to talk about uh, physics inside of Stardust. Uh, I previously had done uh, an example of an effect in this video called uh, pixelization and physics. And I kind of talked about setting up a grid of cubes and giving them physical properties to interact with kind of like a noise field and assign a texture and move them around. So you can watch that if uh, you want to see an example of using physics uh, specifically I guess and another instance is uh, this animation I made when I was trying to create some new graphics for my reel. Uh, I have this OBJ animated sequence uh, standing up and then uh, emitting particles which are getting set to cubes and they have dynamics turned on and they're colliding with the environment and the object itself and they have low gravity so they're kind of moving around so that said I kind of want to just do an overview of using it rather than kind of using it specifically an example I just kind of wanted to go over like the typical uh, workflow how I've been using it uh, what some of the properties are and uh, maybe some best practices uh, I'm not an expert but I've been using it <laughs> for a little bit so I'm just gonna share what I've learned all right so let's jump in because this is gonna be uh, kind of long. So first off, let's start with a default scene. And we'll call make a new solid, apply stardust. And let's jump over to the presets. Let's go to physical and dynamic. And we'll hit replace, which is going to replace the setup that we have from the default. Okay, so let's first add a camera so that we can get a better view of this scene get like a three-quarter view and zoom out a little bit uh, first things first uh, when you first do physics uh, your file has to be saved because Stardust is gonna create a cache file uh, in the directory where your scene is saved so since I've saved the scene it's okay and we are going to select all minimize and go up to the top up here and by default under physics, this is set to off. So now that we have it saved and it knows that there's a location, that's fine. So let's turn it on. Uh, the other option is freeze. We'll get to that in a second. But as we turn that on, we can now RAM preview and see these particles colliding with each other as they're born and then colliding with the primitive uh, box that is made inside of Stardust. If we look at the setup here, Uh, we can see our default emitter set to point with some speed. Uh, the particle is attached to that and it's set to model. And they are attached to this model here, which is a primitive sphere. And they have a material. And they have a physical node. So the two nodes that we're mostly going to be talking about are down here. So there's a uh, physical and forces we're going to go over. Uh, both of these also, if you right click, you can do new node and their physical and physical forces. So the physical you attach directly to your particle and then you get some options in here. So we have uh, dynamic, kinematic, uh, some primitive types, sphere and box, which are going to be your fastest to calculate and then model, which is going to look at the surface of your model and do calculations based on that. Friction, bounce, mass, damp, damp forces. Uh, damp forces, if like you have a wind, you can adjust how over time it kind of uh, has a reduced effect on it. And randomization and static until hit. So you can have things that, uh, let's say, don't start falling right away until something else collides into them. Like if you're going to do a wall or with like bricks or text or something that people are going to bump into, things of that nature. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of like the basic, uh, basics of just the physical, uh, node that you're adding. So again, back to the setup, emitter, particle, particle type, and physics. And then here we have a free floating object, which is the floor, which is a primitive cube. And it is also attached to a material and there's a physical node and it's set to kinematic so that it is just uh, reactive and not actually moving and dynamic. And then there's friction and bounce and stuff attached to this as well. 
Uh, there is a Clyde width, so if you wanted it to, uh, this would probably be more on your uh, active dynamic, you can have it collide with just kinematic objects instead of itself if you were looking for that effect. Um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of like your, your basic setup, right? So kind of back to this top up here, talk about a couple of other properties that are hidden up here. So we have our simulation set to on, and it's currently, if you actually turn on your info window, oh, stop previewing that, uh, info, you can see when you're RAM previewing that it's writing these cache files to that location, and then now it's just playing it back. Ah, messed all this up. And then now, let's say you were happy with that, you've got your animation looking pretty good, the next step would be to set this to freeze, and now it's no longer going to write those uh, cache files, I mean, and it's going to just be reading from them. Uh, you can also disable this auto cache on for like when it's uh, set to on so that you can only deliberately tell it to when to cache in and out. Uh, but I find that auto is fine and kind of works for the general purposes. Uh, but once you freeze it, uh, the nice thing is, is that you can then kind of dial in your shaders. Say you wanted your particles to be random from a gradient and you wanted to dial in the reflection. You know, it's nice to not have to worry about simulating and calculating every frame of your animation. Once it's uh, frozen, the data is there, and then you can just adjust your lighting and everything. Um, so yeah, so in the last settings right here are gravity. Uh, world scale is kind of like a global multiplier on all of your forces and values, just kind of make, if you're trying to make it feel smaller or larger. And your, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> and your margin threshold is for your calculation fidelity. So um, I guess I kind of jumped over this too. So these are your two things that are going to be for how how detailed your simulation is. Uh, high is good for most things. Um, very high works when you're trying to get some precise calculations from, say, like a lot of objects uh, colliding with the surface or if your surface is uh, deforming. Um, you know, you might have to bump that up. I have some specific examples of where we can look at that. And then margin threshold uh, is kind of like the bounding box around these objects. Um, going really small with these values here uh, is going to dramatically slow down and increase your calculation time. So just be careful that you don't want to go too low. I find if I drop it down to like 20, usually works in most situations. So next thing to look at is forces. So if I click and drag out, we can see the forces and we can see what types we have here. We have directional, spherical, noise, path, and connect. So to go over each of these, uh, I've created a scene where I've just already attached them to one setup, and this setup is this, which is a uh, grid of cubes being born with some random rotation and color and scale when they're falling and colliding with this kind of sandbox that I made. And we have like a spotlight to create some nice shadows and some secondary lights just for looks. Um, so in this setup, uh, instead of just having a floor primitive, I've set up a couple of extra ones to be our walls and our top and bottom there. And I've attached them to a physical node, all to one. And I've had it set to simulate using model so that it's calculating each of these instead of uh, just putting a box or sphere around all of those objects. Um, that is that. So it's kind of, you know, the basics of that same preset that we loaded. So we can move that down. And then up here we have our uh, emitter. Like I said, a grid uh, has a little bit of speed. Those are being attached to a primitive cube. Our particle set to model. And it has a little bit of a size random. And our physical node, again, is attached directly to our particle node. And it's set to box, because now we have cubes. And they're set to dynamic, collide with everything, and they kind of have some randomization and some friction bounce. So if I ran preview this, there's going to be a lot of RAM preview, so I apologize for that, but I think it's better just to kind of show by example, and so you can kind of see the speed of some of this stuff too. 
Uh, this isn't a crazy computer that I have. Um, I do have a pair of GPU cards, so it's nice that it will utilize the CPU and GPU where it finds necessary for like physics stuff uh, and 3D stuff, basic. Most, most things uh, it tries to accelerate. Um, but yeah, you can just see how it calculates. Hopefully it's not too annoying. Okay, so we have our cubes following, colliding with our surface and moving around. They seem to be uh, calculating their hits pretty good. And again, this is at the default. If I can jump back up here to the top. This is at high and our margin threshold is set to 40, which is the default value. You could like lower the gravity Recalculate. And you can see things uh, bounce and kind of float up in the air a bit more. A little bit more zero gravity. Well, lower gravity, not zero. But you get what I mean. Cool. So that's pretty simple. It's really straightforward. Uh, we're just adding two extra nodes to our setup and all suddenly we're getting physics. So it's pretty great. Uh, let's jump into forces now. So forces again, same setup. I'm going to create a null real quick and make that 3d just so we have a point of reference for our world space here. And if again, this is the same setup, all this stuff, all I've done is add in a forces node, um, which you could again, right click, and do physical forces or just drag it off from here. I'm starting with uh, directional and I have it set to a randomization of 75 and I've drawn a graph here for how it affects over the life. So our particles are living to be five seconds long. And so this graph is a representation of that life. So at the beginning, they are 0% affected and then by 18%, they're fully affected. And then 58%, it drops off. And at the end of their life, it's set to zero. I have it in a positive in the X. So if we select our null, we can see this way is positive. So they're gonna fall, collide. And then now that they're old enough, 18% of their life, they're gonna start pushing over to the right side of this box. There you go. Looks nice. So here, okay. So again, we're at the default settings of uh, high and you can see that a couple of cubes are escaping there. Just the uh, threshold, they're just kind of passing through. So if we went up to our physics and set this to very high and move back to the beginning and recache this, you can solve things like that. So, you know, as you're simulating, you're basically going to probably, you know, if you're in production, you're going to just be trying to figure out the basics of your simulation, get it looking good, get everything working. And then when you really need to get that extra level of quality for final, then maybe you can start playing with the actual physical quality and the uh, margin threshold to dial it in. So there, it's kind of nice now is that they are all staying in, but they're actually being blown so hard against the wall that they're kind of climbing up and out and move away. So cool. So that's uh, the directional. It's very straightforward. Um, the other values are just for, you know, affecting it in the Y and Z. Uh, so this node uh, doesn't have a fall off. It is a full on infinite uh, force. So the next one is spherical. And spherical is going to give us uh, a couple of new options. So first off, um, we get a size that it's uh, affecting. We still get an over life graph. You get uh, the ability to swirl and you can choose an axis for that. And you can affect it by distance. So there's a couple of new properties here. Um, if you wanted to use a light uh, you have a starting width so you can pick a very specific light 
So this is nice, like say you wanted to put a spherical force in each corner of this box. You could have a A light, a B light, and then you can just tell it uh, specifically which one. So you could have one of these forces uh, pulling objects towards it and one is maybe pushing it away. So let's see what that looks like with just this one force. Um, it's at 960, 540, which is dead center of our uh, project here. And we're gonna set the amount to 300, just to see it. And the sphere size we'll leave at its default, 500. We're gonna preview that. And you can see that right now, everything is being sucked into the center of our spherical area with a positive value. So we can play that, it all gets sucked in really fast. So now we could set this to, let's say, negative and see the inverse of that, which is as they're falling, again, it's over their life. I have it set to where they kind of fall and then get affected by it. It is pushing everything away from it. So we could turn this down. Maybe that's way too dramatic, but you get a good sense of uh, how that force is affecting this. A much subtler effect, but they're all kind of getting pushed away. So now uh, let's turn off the amount and let's do swirl. Let's do 100 just to see what that looks like. So we should get a nice counterclockwise rotation there. Uh, we have it set to Y, so it's uh, affecting this on the Y axis and it's kind of swirling them around. You know, this could look really cool if you had uh, trails on these guys. Oh, speaking of, I'm so sorry that I didn't mention that before. That is a big mess up on my part. There it is. Um, let's jump back to this for a second. Completely whiffed on this but it's very important so i've froze the simulation right the other benefit to this is when i was talking about that you can dial in your lighting and you know your look of everything the other cool thing is if you have it frozen you can also add in replicas for free so let's say we do uh seven so eight total plus our original and let's rotate this like in the y 15 degrees and ram preview that and you get that same simulation uh, replicated at no extra cost, which is pretty amazing that you can do something like that. Uh, again, you could do any of these settings in here and it's gonna let you do all of those and you're not adding any extra calculation or processing time to this besides adding a lot more of whatever you're replicating. So that's pretty awesome and that is another benefit of freezing your simulation you would not want to calculate that uh, <laughs> with it unfrozen and live you could I wouldn't all right let's go back where were we at we were at spherical and um, we have added swirl so I was saying you could add trails to that and then that immediately made me think of extra copies which, you know, adding same thing, you know, now that we've cached this, we could set it to freeze, add in a replica node. And in this case, we don't want our whole system. We want just this particle. And let's set that to, you know, eight, 15, something like that. And you start to get some really cool animations. Um, with that, you know, you could do maybe like a animate properties, trim it over its life or something. And you can get some uh, pretty cool results with that. All right, so that is our first two forces, directional and spherical. Now let's look at noise. So let's jump over here. 
Again, same project. I'm going to hit RAM preview. Our cubes are falling, and this time, as they're falling, they start to get pushed around by our noise force. And let's take a look at the settings on that. So I've set the type to noise, and then we get some new options. Our noise type, there's a default in flow. Flow is kind of like a curl noise. I have another scene where we can look at that. Uh, but it's basically just, you know, another algorithm for how it's calculating that noise or formula, whatever the proper terminology is there. Uh, turbulence type uh, lets you. So again, here, here's another one where we get a spherical option so that you can do uh, different types. And then um, just kind of like your nor normal turbulence uh, that you would apply to normal particles. And then you can do infinite and sphere on this one. And then you can also pick an axis. Uh, if you only wanted it to affect on, let's say, just a Z, X, or Y, uh, we have a position that you can animate for offset, or you could also animate the speed. Uh, the uh, amount I found to be very um, sensitive, so never really pushed this too far. So like at 15, it's pretty active. So if I set this to 5, I've also bumped up the default scale from 100 to 300, and I've left all the other values at the default. So if I preview this, it'll fall and you can see that it still is getting pushed around by that noise, but to a lesser extent. So again, this uh, amount here is going to be very sensitive. So I know you're immediately going to want to jump in and crank that up to like 55 or 75, but just be very cautious that uh, with physics, it's kind of uh, more dialed in there. So that's looking cool. It's interesting. You can get some cool movement out of that. You could add some speed to it. So, I mean, it, let's maybe keep it at 10 and let's do like a crazy amount in our speed just so we can kind of see that in our preview here. So it's basically going to kind of make them undulate and move a bit uh, swirlier rather than move just through that noise that was static before we set the uh, speed to a value. We can ramp preview that. And you can see kind of how our particles are moving and swaying as that noise is animated. Um, yeah, so that's pretty straightforward, right? There's nothing crazy or complicated. Um, let's look at the default type. Uh, that was default. Uh, now we've set it to flow. I have set my scale to half of what it was set at default, and my value is at 20. And I have the uh, speed animated, but we could just set that to zero just to kind of get a default look at how a flow varies. Um, I don't know the specific, again, I don't know the differences between these types. It's just a alternate, so you can have a couple of options there. I think you still kind of get a generalized movement that is similar. I mean, based on the scales and frequency and speed of it, you know, you're going to get different results, but that's there. I'm kind of explaining it. Not really. Don't know how to talk about it much more than that. So next one, let's jump on to path. So these last two, I feel like those first four are kind of pretty straightforward and typical. The last two are kind of interesting and unique. Um, so let's look at those, uh, path, uh, I have turned off my default lights that I've been using in all these scenes and I have just one light now and I've animated it in the X, uh, moving to the left, but in the beginning of the scene, it's set to static. So now the force that we have in here, I've set to path and I've chosen it to use that very specific light for the path, uh, which lights are the best use of this. And uh, randomization is set to zero. The amount is one. This is another uh, value that I found to be very sensitive. So I kind of initially wanted to crank this up, but I found that to make it kind of overactive. So setting it to one seems to be like a good base amount to go off of. And uh, effect over life is set to just the default. So it's just immediately affecting it. Um, I have it set to speed along path 100. So basically my particles are going to fall with gravity and collide and then try to attract to the motion path of our light. 
and this is how much it is uh, moving. And there's like a delay, which is really nice. So as I ram preview this, you'll see that they all move and kind of collide and get to that point. But then as soon as this light starts moving, uh, there's kind of this inherent delay driven by this value here uh, as they try to catch up to that new position. There you go. You can see they're kind of slowly all trickling their way that way. And again, this is just controlled by this delay and delay random. So that's pretty cool. I feel like this has a lot of really cool uses. Um, jumping back to this scene over here real quick. Uh, in the presets, physical miscellaneous, uh, there's a lot of really cool interesting setups in here just to kind of see how they're using it in their setups and kind of uh, understanding of some of these uh, in a little bit more detail. Here's flow being used on a lot of particles and I think it makes it more evident to see that kind of noise pattern. Uh, loading custom shapes, uh, colliding static geo with a uh, dynamic geo. Same thing here with this wall. And um, yeah, some kind of moving, interacting. Uh, this path one, there's a light that is animated and all these objects are moving along that path. So these are some great examples to see uh, how they've set things up. And I think they're always a great like jumping off point. Uh, so if we go back to path, you can see how that's working. Again, you know, like if you had like a 3D scene with a nice track camera and you had 3D, uh, you know, knolls moving throughout your scene, it could be cool to have these move around in your scene. Have these uh, move around in your scene. All right. And so that's pretty much it on the path. Uh, you can have multiple uh, lights and then it'll try to go to the nearest one uh, that's pretty interesting or you could also you know with the uh, effect over life property you could have two different paths that you're kind of blending in, be in between so you could have one light that uh, is affecting it and that at towards the end of its life it stops affecting it and then you could have another one that is you know the inverse of that where it's not affecting it and then gradually affects it so you can do some like really interesting combinations with the movement and I think that uh, this is a pretty powerful interesting tool um, the last one here is connect and same thing uh, connect here's a default setup I have turned on the helpers so that we can see visualize the connections so on my connect here I have turned on the bounding box here so that we can see the connections and you can see immediately it is drawing connections as the particles are born and then creating a point distance between them to try to maintain and move around so we get this kind of really cool snake-like animation again these uh, visualizing the constraints isn't for rendering it's just for seeing where and how Stardust is drawing the, the lines. Um, so just to remember that. Uh, all right, let's look at the node. So I grouped everything up here for some reason in this one. I guess I was trying to be tidy, uh, but it's still the same setup, except I've added in a sphere. I don't know why the uh, physical node there was turned off. It was colliding with it. Anyways, uh, connect here. We have it set to connection type, point. There's two options, point and spring. There's connect using chain groups and chain groups. Uh, groups are considered not groups like me making this grid group, but um, groups as in the input nodes that are coming into it. So let's say I had two systems. Uh, you could uh, connect make connections between those two uh, the other thing that was connected in here let's say this was another system it's not but it would look as those two inputs as groups um, so right now it's set to chain and you can set the first and last to static uh, maybe that's good for like making say like a physical chain where you wanted uh, your particles to connect across and make like a dynamic rope or something 
You can do things like that. You can tell it to uh, self collide and then there's a enable disable at the bottom. Uh, so that is point. Let's set it to spring and see the difference. I think if I move the camera in here a little bit, you can get a better look at spring. So as some of these particles fall and they're connected to each other, uh, they'll kind of have tension between them and kind of push and tug on each other. So there's a good instance where you see those two, like this one wants to fall because of gravity, but uh, he's parented to this guy and getting constrained back towards him. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, I think this is kind of more open to interpretation of like creating some interesting setups. So I think there's a lot of fun to be had with this. Uh, let's look at groups. So let's change this sphere to actually just be an emitter here. I'm gonna connect the physical to up here now. I'm gonna set our particle type to model. I'm gonna set it to a longer life, like 12. And then our emitter, we're gonna set to once, one particle, zero speed. And then let's maybe move our emitter down, or the other way, sorry, down right? I can't see it. Oh, it's just massive. That's what's going on. Uh, let's set our particle type to one, our particle size, not type. And then let's set this back to 540. There we go. I knew I was going the right way. So as I'm moving this, you can see that it's colliding with our object and I'm going to move it over and maybe something like that. And then let's move this down and let's go ahead and connect this to that particle. And now if we go to our connect, we can set this to groups. And now it'll try to draw constraints between the two groups. And since this uh, second group is just a single object, it is all trying to connect each particle specifically to the anchor point of that object. So that's weird and interesting. And then there's also chain groups, which is the first or the last one to enter the uh, emitter is connected to the newest. So if this was, uh, let's set our model down. I think that's our real problem. So let's set this to like 10. We can set our particle size back to maybe 10 or maybe five. And then we could set this to maybe like default and turn on the physical to dynamic sphere. And what else do we need to do here? Where is our, why are our spheres moving through our floor there? So what happens when you do things that aren't rehearsed. <laughs> this is all going excellent. What have I done? I think we were better off set to physical model. And this Set to sphere. Uh, let's maybe turn up our settings to very high. Zero effect. Let's lower this. Zero effect. So, all right. So it's definitely from our size. So let's set our particle to the default 10. And let's set our sphere to one.
Yeah, it seems like the model size being bigger and driving that through the model size instead of the particle size has a different effect on your particles. Collisions. So sometimes you saw me uh, just kind of moving around through a bunch of different settings trying to hunt it down, but I think that was the uh, problem that I've run into a couple of times. So <laughs> they're not doing great though, huh? Hmm. There they go. Now they're acting as they should. Before they were just kind of stacking up. It was really odd. Oh, there they go. They're doing it again. <laughs> That's pretty funny. What if we increase their bounce and lower their mass and friction? What do we get then? Let's also add some randomization to their size. Maybe like 25%. And let's go back and change their uh, chain type to, let's do groups. And now we get this kind of really crazy result where as particles are being born, they're getting attached to the last in the system. So that's crazy. We can turn off those previews just to see what that looks like. It looks like madness. So again, I think this is like something that <laughs> I feel like you could come up with very specific scenarios. I actually have one and another After Effects here. Uh, so I made this, um, which is particles that are physical emitting and colliding with each other and this typography that's set from a model. And they are creating chains between each other to kind of create a connection between them and then they're creating auxiliary particles and then I'm meshing all of that but the meshing is another story but if you just can look at the um, setup here this is just one way of using connect and groups um, in a interesting weird way again I think this is trying to find these kind of creative uses of things like this where you can kind of you know once I saw that um, the chain, like, you know, when we had this together in, in the beginning of just creating a chain, I thought that, you know, that kind of snake weird animation would be, I was wondering if you could do dripping with that. So that's kind of what led me down that path to doing something like slime or whatever. But so I think this is going to take some tinkering with playing with, but I think there is a lot of cool potential here. And then with that, I think that is the last of the forces. And I think we made it through all of them. So that's pretty much it. You know, it's not too crazy, huh? It's pretty simple. It's just about a lot of like playing with different settings to get different results, playing with kind of like the fidelity of those results, freezing those things, and then dialing in your uh, aesthetically, your lighting, shading. Um, a couple of extra things I wanted to talk about were, uh, it's nice, like, so I've had this kind of primitive floor in here throughout the animations, but I've also thrown a deform, and it's cool that uh, the physics will recognize the deformation on models that you're uh, putting in. This could also be an external model, like a landscape that you've brought in, and the same idea would apply to that as well. So I thought that was cool, and it's like, you know, really fast for what it's calculating. Uh, another example of that is I did the same thing, uh, deformed a box, but this time I did a texture, which is just kind of like a radial rings animating outwards from the center. And you can see the particles falling and colliding with these uh, waves that are being created by that deformation. So again, it's pretty cool, like the kind of calculations that you can get out of this and how it's calculating. So I think you can also see uh, when the second wave comes you know, I have set the calculation to very high, but you can still see that some of the objects are kind of falling through it just because I don't have enough uh, surface information on this plane, probably. 
So I could fix that with by playing by the threshold or setting that to even higher, like extreme, and it'd probably get those calculations. But I was trying to keep it speed wise, like, you know, that wasn't too bad to RAM preview that and play it back. But it's a pretty cool uh, interaction that they've built in within itself. Um, mm, text. Uh, so <laughs> for the model type on this, I set it to uh, the model source instead of primitive. I set it to text mask, picked a text layer that I have here live, and I have it set to creating a mesh by the edge. And you can play with the bevel profile. And under physical, I've set this to uh, model instead of sphere or box. And then that is a lot. Oops, sorry, After Effects. Uh, that is allowing it to calculate kind of based specifically on the letters. So that's pretty cool. Um, it'd be cool if it broke it up into individual letters, but that's kind of dreaming. Maybe we'll see one day. That's that. And then what else do we have here? Oh, this is loading in a custom model. So on the model on this one, I have it set to uh, an OBJ that I brought in. It's a ring with some little bit of detail work. But as they're emitting in various sizes, you can see that they're kind of interlocking with each other and creating a really cool animation. By using the uh, model type under physical, it's able to kind of calculate specifically that bounding box of the mesh, which is really nice because some uh, physics will only do like the whole. And so getting these kind of shapes to interlock and lay like this is, uh, is pretty rad that it's doing this inside of After Effects. Um, I found some software really struggles with doing things like that. So that's pretty rad. Um, and again, like if you were using connect on this and you connected like the first and last, you could really kind of create a really cool chain link there and have it dynamics swing around. Uh, the last one is another importing an OBJ. So in this case, I made a simple uh, box and I deleted the top and the front face I brought in with a so when I imported my geometry it asked me if I wanted to bring in my materials that I had assigned which I did so that it would create uh, material tags or ID tags per object and then I can assign different materials to it so I created a transparent shader that I'm applying to the front face so that we can see into it uh, but all of our particles are still colliding with it and here I have two emitters uh, balls in this corner and boxes in this corner and I'm just letting it gonna let this play and you can see that they are colliding with the uh, OBJ that I've brought in and each other and creating this kind of fun animation of all the stuff falling down so I don't think I've really ram previewed this all the way through either but we'll see here so that's it I think I wanted to end on that um, Hopefully that gives you a good uh, introduction to physics inside Stardust and you can jump in and kind of start playing with things and creating some fun animations. Uh, that's it for now. Thanks for watching and hopefully this was helpful.